Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. You're on Think Tech Asia here on a Monday with Russell Yu, who joins us by Zoom from a coffee shop. How surprised are we now? A coffee <laughs> shop in Beijing. Hi, Russell. Good morning. Well, it's early morning, and I have to have my cup of coffee here um, <laughs> and uh, to be on the show, Jay. <laughs> I, I, you find these coffee shops everywhere. You must be more knowledgeable about coffee shops in Beijing than any other person in the world. We are yet again impressed, Russell. And it makes us want to go over there and have a cup of coffee with you, actually. <laughs> Maybe we'll have you up here, Jane. We can do a joint show live uh, back to our audience in Honolulu and the world, over the world, anywhere else. There you go. Okay, so we're, the title of our discussion today is, <laughs> I like this a lot, coming to America is not easy. <laughs> and then, if you are a Chinese technology company, coming to America is not easy. So just a, a little background, you can you know, embellish if you like. Um, so um, Mr. Trump um, started this, uh, this trade contention over tariffs. And without getting into you know, the wisdom of that, of which there is none, um, he, he, uh, he threatened uh, China, well, he actually imposed sub substantial tariffs against China. And China is not going to take that lying down, so China responds. But the response is more than counter-tariffs. Uh, we can talk about what, you know, how this all kind of accelerated. It started off with counter-tariffs. Um, and then Trump responds by saying that Chinese goods are not only, what, unfair in the, in the global trade marketplace, um, but they also are espionage. These, these, these electronics that come to the United States from, from China are devices of espionage. Uh, and, of course, that obviously um, uh, supports his tariffs against them. Um, it also ex uh, it, 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 it accelerates, um, you know, the contention between the countries. Um, and it is very bad for U.S.-China relations and for anybody watching for him to do that. So the question I put to you is, you know, what has happened, Russell? Um, is this appropriate? Are these devices that China is making and selling to us devices of espionage? Well, Jay, I think this uh, uh, talk about um, uh, companies, Chinese companies, technology companies, some of their products in China. Uh, there's always been talk about that. Even before uh, President Trump was elected, there was discussion saying that uh, the Chinese companies are capable of uh, putting in uh, certain things that could be Trojan horses that can spy on the U.S. Um, and it's, it's, it's not new. It, it's back in, t I believe, in 2012 when a company called Huawei and BTE were both singled out as claiming that they were uh, working uh, to um, uh, to bring back secrets back to China. However, no evidence was ever found, or at least disclosed to the public. Um, so fast forward, we come into the Trump era. And at this time, you know, there's a trade war looming. China has responded to the initial salvo by President Trump on the tariffs on steel and iron, but they have not hit the American industry. But what's taking shape actually is another uh, probably trade war front, and that's with um, technology. Um, and, and this year, January, Huawei, which is the third world third largest manufacturer of smartphones uh, behind Samsung and Apple, I think it might have taken overtaken Apple in sales at this point. Uh, sales reaches over $36 billion, and they ship over 165 million headsets worldwide. They're big coming out party was supposed to have been a deal with AT&T to sell their phones through the AT&T channels. Unfortunately, uh, there was a letter from congressional leaders, uh, again, with no evidence pointing out, saying that we believe that it, uh, the Huawei is a threat to national security, and they lobbied AT&T to drop the deal, which they did. So here we are, um, again, um, with a uh, so with a with a new frontal attack on trade, possibly. Hmm. Yeah, here we are. 
Um, and so, I mean, when you take that together with the tariffs, you are escalating tensions is what you're doing. You know, I, I was telling you before that, I mean, I believe that there have been people coming and going uh, from, from China and from the U.S. and crossing that border with, uh, you know, with the idea of, of reporting back to some government agency, both ways. And that's been going on for years. Um, and, it's, you know, it's not critical. It may not be all that secret what they bring back, but they do that and it happens. So, you know, the thing is that it's not discussed. It's not discussed in the newspaper. Um, and to the extent that there's um, worse things happening in, in espionage, espionage isn't usually um, public. Uh, it's handled in other ways. It's handled by, you know, the intelligence agencies. But in this case, it sounds to me like um, this possibility, whether it's real or not, I don't know. Um, you've said it's not real and that there, is, there are no Trojan horses. Um, sounds like it's going public. And this administration is taking something which um, you know, may or may not be true and making it a public spectacular. And, and the result is, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how the, the policymakers in Washington feel about it, but I'm very uncomfortable about it. And the people I talk to are uncomfortable about the notion that we're arguing about espionage in public, as well as tariffs. And so the relationship, which I thought, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, with China was pretty good and it was, you know, it was, it was going good places. Now it doesn't feel good at all. Um, now it feels like there's tension over things that may or may not be real. But this tension, the tension is real. And this president is, uh, is accelerating, an, um, you know, an argument with, on so many points with them. Well, Jay, let me, uh, Jay, let me add something uh, to this, my observation. Um, I'm not saying that it's not real. I'm not saying it's not happening. We just don't know. But we have a lot of vague statements. Now, if it was real, we would be like what's happening in the news now, where Mueller has done an investigation has found that there have been Russian uh, uh, actually naming and indicting people, uh, conducting espionage from the Russian side uh, with our uh, political system. So that's real. That's, that's something that's in, our, in American society, it's always transparent. But here we're having a lot of people saying, well, uh, our leaders saying that Oh, there's something that, that, that the Chinese are capable of doing, but nothing is pointed, pointed out. What's disturbing is that I don't think it's just the technology. I think in the recent news in the last month, um, the uh, FBI director has said that uh, Chinese society, they're a threat to American society. And he singled out Chinese students coming to the U.S. to study as potential um, people could conduct espionage. Again, uh, if there are these things happening, uh, I think the, the government, the process in the U.S. would take care of itself. The criminal process, that would be something that would be in play. But we haven't seen that. We haven't seen it. So we are, it's almost kind of like a hysteria that there's Chinese espionage. And if you're Chinese, you are doing something bad. If you're a Chinese company, you're doing something bad. I'll, I'll point out, Jay, to another company called um, uh, D, DJI, which you can find uh, in the Apple store. They sell a lot of drones. Um, they're the number one manufactured drones. And last year, Homeland Security was saying that we think that DJI is maybe committing espionage for China, but no evidence again. And so all of these things um, are something that um, apparently there's there's a mass hysteria that, that um, we should not have take any products that are coming from China, period. Yeah, isn't there a rational way to test on this, Russell? Um, in the case of DGI, I suppose the um, the concern is that uh, you send the drone up and it takes pictures, and the pictures somehow mm -hmm. find their way uh, from the drone to intelligence agencies in China. I find that I find that hard to believe just on the surface of what the technology is like these days. It's hard enough to get the pictures right down on the ground, much less to China. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, isn't it easy to take the thing apart and look at, you know, we know about drones. We have a lot of expertise about drones. Why can't we just take it apart and look at the pieces and decide and examine whether the pieces are a, a doing that or capable of doing that and doing mm -hmm. that? Um, I, well, I don't know why the government is making these speculative statements when it could come to a pretty 
easy black and white conclusion. And, and by the way, the same thing with the, um, what is it, the Huawei um, telephones. If I'm using a Huawei telephone in the United States to say, you know, to call my uncle in Sheboygan, um, they, they can probably tell, can't they, if that message is actually going to an agency in Beijing at the same time. And by the way, I don't know if, you know, Beijing would really care about my telephone call with my uncle in Sheboygan anyway. Um, but let, let's assume that it was possible, and, and I, in that case, more than the drone, I think it is possible. Can't they engineer it, take it apart, and find out? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right on that, Jay. Um, two, two observations here. Um, DJI um, has a feature on the drones where the operator can disconnect um, the Internet connection. Uh, when it flies around. So in other words, it won't be able to send any information over the internet. You can actually locally disconnect that. Um, so you won't have any uh, threat of sending anything back to another country, some information. Um, so the other thing that strikes me is that uh, I believe that if in fact you upload something to the server, many companies will have uh, their servers available. So you can upload information there it would seem to me that maybe you may want to look at the cybersecurity law and say, if you're going to sell things in the U.S., DGI, you should have the local server in the U.S. So any data goes to the U.S. server, does not go anywhere but the U.S. server. So therefore, we can expect that server. You know, Again, that, that is something if you wanted to control uh, security in that sense. Um, but it's amazing because um, you know the um, Huawei has uh, 70 million uh, users of their phone worldwide. I guess that's a lot of people to track and monitor. Um, incredible to think that that's happening. Well, you know, I, uh, they, they, the Huawei is a pretty good phone. And uh, with a little effort, it might be a better phone than Apple. It might be a better phone than Samsung in the years to come. I mean, they got a huge testing base with those 70 million people plus. And so, um, you know, I think it's a real economic threat to Apple and for that matter to Samsung to have you know, an open trade with the Huawei phones. But let me ask you, I mean, this is all so far, am I right? This is all talk. This is the Trump administration saying, we believe for some reason that it, they can't tell us why. We believe that these devices and maybe others too are, you know, instruments of, of, of espionage uh, in our country. And therefore, what? What's the conclusion? What's the action? Uh, are they trying to stop this on the basis of some U.S. Uh, statute that prohibits the introduction of such, you know, devices into the country? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the whole thing about this is that it's all speculation. And yes, um, we have a legitimate interest, a uh, national security interest, to watch for this if this happens. But unless there's some articular basis, we are a very transparent society. Uh, we should make it clear if there's a threat or not. What really is concerning is, like you say, maybe they have a better product. The Huawei, uh, the phone that they're trying to introduce, uses state-of-the-art Leica uh, lenses, and they shoot better pictures, frankly, than many of these smartphones. It's a Leica f camera, actually. Made. And I've, t I've tested that out here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Fantastic pictures. So, you know, it's interesting because they're number two or number three. I think they might have surpassed Apple sales, which means they have not hit the biggest market in the U.S. Once you're in the biggest market, they will probably purely dominate the smartphone uh, uh, in the yeah. U.S. pocket. Yeah, that, that's Worldwide. really yeah. That's very interesting. You know, fact is that the, I mean, everybody knows about, what is it, Fox, Fox, Fox. Uh, Fo the matter Fox of fact, Con. huh? Was it Fox Foxconn? They, they, Fox Cup. They're the Taiwanese company that makes it for a Apple. And All they the and they make the phones China. in China, right? Yes. So yes. I mean, if if we are worried about the uh, Huawei phones made in China uh, with some Trojan horse kind of device in there, um, why are we not worried about the iPhones that are made in China? Um, you know, in the same way, maybe across the street. Uh, why wouldn't they have um, Trojan horses in them? They're both made in China. And can't we test in each case, in either case, as to whether that might be so? I don't see the distinction between, you know, the, the Huawei and, and the iPhone. Well, Jay, it's because you're a trained lawyer, and I'm a trained lawyer, right? Logic. 
the logic goes like this. It's a syllogism. The major premise is all smartphones made in China are used to conduct espionage for China. Okay, that's a major premise. The minor premise is Apple smartphones are made in China. The conclusion, logically, therefore, Apple smartphones are made for espionage for China. And it doesn't make sense. It's that's ridiculous. called the fallacy of the inverted middle. And speaking of middle, that, Russell, <laughs> we're at the middle of our show now, and we're going to have the truth of the inverted middle by way of one minute break. <laughs> <laughs> at the middle. And I can take uh, my for coffee. Okay. Yes, you can. We'll be right back with Russell Yu, joining us by Zoom from Beijing. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day? What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. A little better. Try a little more, more than everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrieli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matters to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii, with some extraordinary guests, the students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So young talents making way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. <music> back from the inverted middle. We've come from the, the middle kingdom, if you will. <laughs> and now we're back with Russell Yu, who joins us from an unnamed coffee shop somewhere in the heart of Beijing. And we're talking about <clears throat> coming to America is not easy if you are a Chinese technology company these days. So, you know, the thing is that this thing about the technology, equipment, the devices um, with, you know, Trojan horse type, you know, functionality, um, doing espionage, there's, there's actually no barrier. In the case, in the case of, uh, unless I don't have it right, in the case of the tariffs, we know the tariffs are now, at least for a while, they're a matter of law. But the thing that this thing about the uh, devices that do espionage, there's nothing is being, you know, prevented from coming in the country right now. And maybe they'll, those guys will be seeking some kind of rule or statute to that effect later, but not now. The other thing, what interests me, though, is this, this is all part of a kind of mm, a, a continuum, a campaign, if you will, to say that things from China uh, are tainted with espionage, every one of them, and every person is potentially, you know. So what did the uh, deputy director of the FBI say? You have a quote, right? Well, I think I think the actual director said that, which is drawing a lot of uh, uh, alarm in the U.S. by U.S. citizens as well, especially people who are of Chinese descent, who are Americans, um, like me. Uh, and I think some of the things that is scary um, is that uh, he's recently said one of the things we're trying to do is view the China threat as not just a wall of a government threat, but a whole society threat on their end. And I find that very overreaching. Um, I think national interest for U.S. is very important. I support that. But I think the key is if there's something that's articulable, say it. What is it? Um, it's one broad stroke. It's almost a mass hysteria that we're leading our country into. We're having people uh, turn and say all Chinese are bad. Uh, we're having the government saying that all Chinese students that come to America to study are bad. Uh, and I, I, I don't know. Maybe there are some. But, again, I, you can't say that for everybody. It reminds me of our constitutional issue that we had with the internment of Japanese Americans back in World War II. All Japanese uh, of descent, even if you're Americans, are spies for the Japan government. We had the Korematsu case. And all of these things that leads me to think we're leading in a direction, not only being isolationist, but again, it's, it's an issue that's a large issue that I think affects internally within our own country. Although we're talking about uh, um, so-called perceptions by the American public that are being made by authorities that says Chinese are, are, are doing bad things. 
but nothing has been shown or proven yet. Again, this is a little bit scary in a dem democratic society in the U.S. Well, you know, this, this goes to a larger picture, and I'd like to comment on that for a moment. Last week, um, we had a, uh, a big event on um, Asia-Pacific policy here uh, in the form of the Board of Governors of Pacific Forum. And Think Tech was there. Uh, we taped and we are broadcasting on OC16 um, the proceedings in two parts, uh, one this week and one will be broadcast next week, of a conversation uh, between Ralph Kosa, who's the president of Pacific Forum, which is a um, you know foreign policy think tank here in Hawaii, and well known uh, in Washington and around Asia Pacific. And he was joined by former Deputy uh, Secretary of State uh, Richard, uh, Richard Armitage. Um, and Armitage pointed out uh, that uh, when some diplomat last year was asked um, if he felt uh, that, uh, that China was um, uh, our friend, he said, sure, it's, it's China is our friend, and, uh, and, and, and so is the Tooth Fairy indicating that um, maybe China wasn't our friend, as we might have contemplated a few years ago, and that China has done things in the global Pacific, in, in the, you know, geopolitical realm, uh, which have, um, you know, not been consistent with good relations with the United States. So, so the gloves, to some extent, have come off, and they are certainly coming off in the Trump administration. Yeah. Um, then he said, this is Richard Armitage, uh, when asked what he thought uh, China was now to the U.S., he said it's an adversary. China's an adversary. Uh, that doesn't mean a foe. Um, it means an adversary. We're in a competition with China. And, um, you know, the gloves, the gloves have, to some extent, come off. And I suggest to you, Russell, that they, indeed they have things in the South China Sea, uh, some of the moves that China has made, uh, some of the, you know, geopolitical things it has done here and elsewhere. When I say here, I mean in China and elsewhere. Um, so the question is, how does it play when this administration, in the face of all of that, says, well, we're going to put uh, big tariffs up against you, and we're going to call your people, you know, uh, spies, and we're going to call your products, your electronic products, devices of espionage. Uh, my concern, as I said before, is that it escalates the tension. In the face of, um, you know, being adversaries, this, this escalates the nature of that adversarial relationship. And I don't think that uh, China is without fault, and certainly I don't think the Trump administration has done anything to ameliorate that. In fact, it's done everything it can to, uh, you know, uh, to accelerate and escalate the tension. Um, so where are we on this? Uh, I would like to see the two countries friendly. I think it's in their interest individually and collectively and in the interest of the world, but we're not going that direction. So what can and should be done when the public starts getting into the, the things and the government tells the public they should worry about espionage? Um, this is not a good sign for future relations. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. I think, I think you pointed something uh, very accurately here. And I think we have to look at it at this way, Jay. Um, we're talking about several layers here. Government to government, that's an issue for the governments to handle. If there's actual evidence, they can handle it between each other. But then when government starts to talk, bring in the people, um, that's another layer. And when you start to bring in companies, the private business sector, that's another company. That's another layer. And the question is that do we put everything in one basket and say, Chinese, if you're a Chinese company, if you're a Chinese person, we put you in the government basket and all of you are bad people. You know, this is a global world. I, I think there are realities here that we have to make careful distinctions and we have to be careful about it. Um, you know, you, one thing is clear is that, um, you know, a company that does $36 billion a year ships 165 million headsets. Do you think they want to be risk uh, to do something like this? Uh, and lose it all overnight, if in fact that they're doing that, I think it, it's it sort of it sort of doesn't make sense here. Uh, I, I think that even for uh, the other company, DJI, do you think they want to risk 
losing their their value at ten billion dollars. Um, they're they're a very big company. DGI uh, is very interesting because they made manufacturing design in Shenzhen, China, but their creative center is in Los Angeles. Their uh, their software people are in San Mateo, California. Their public relations people are in New York. That's all part of their company. And this is a global enterprise that's operating not only in China, but around the world in the U.S. And so we have these accusations that all of you are spies. Again, so uh, where does a line drawn here, Jay? I think unless there's an articulable basis that you can say the people and companies that are doing business, unless you have evidence, let's, let's hear it. Well, you know, what, I, what, I'm, for, what I want to suggest, Russell, and I like your view of it, is that our, our foreign policy with China has not been nuanced. Uh, foreign policy with China has, uh, in some cases, let China get away with things we should not have let them get away with. And, and you can't wait a couple of years and then start criticizing them for it. You have to have an active foreign policy, active diplomatic relations, where you engage with them on a diplomatic level all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, what I, what I see, and, and, and the Obama administration is not without fault here, because they let China get away with a whole bunch of things, including the South China Sea, and we didn't do anything about it. We didn't, we didn't even protest about it. Um, and so we lost our hegemony in that area and are still losing our hegemony in that area uh, to China. Who you know? Who is uh, oh, very, very actively yeah. soliciting relationships with every country around, including trade and every other way. So what I'm saying oh, is that an isolationist policy leads us to a really bad position in dealing with a country like China. We have to actively engage huh. on a diplomatic level. Right, Jake. Um, I don't have all the information. What governments do? I'm not an expert on government. I can't really talk about. You know, if that's right or wrong, uh, what they're doing, uh, the South China Sea. That's something for the governments to handle. I think you're right. We need more engagement, more transparency. And, you know, again, it's something where uh, we become all of a sudden the isolated state in the, in the world. Think about that. We become isolated like North Korea at some point. You know, we become isolated. China has actually come out of it being less isolationist. Um, they're still a developing country. They still have issues. But again, for the most part, um, I think that um, uh, the world has changed now. And yes, um, the U.S. now is facing competition from global competitors. And again, um, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, growing pains for everyone. And I think, yes, I think there needs to be more dialogue. Again, that's what we leave the governments to do. That's that's their domain to work it out. But my concern is more is when we start to say that's not just government, we're saying the people, we're saying the companies are agents for espionage. I think that's kind of far-fetched unless we have evidence, don't we? Um, that means we're saying maybe we can't compete with them. Yes, maybe that's issues that governments need to talk. Okay, the dialogue. But again, the international world has to deal with those issues. Uh, but again, I think that uh, for now, at least, um, it's very difficult, uh, even if you're doing legitimate business, you know, uh, in China, these companies, you know, unless there's something that we can point out, I think uh, we need to be objective about it. Yeah. All right. Very, very interesting discussion. Very interesting point about what's happened. Um, and very interesting implications and suggestions. Thank you so much, Russell Yu, joining us by Zoom from Beijing for our, uh, what, bi-weekly discussions about uh, thinking tech, thinking, think tech in uh, Asia and learning about the relationships involved. Thank you so much, Russell. Sai Jian. Thank you. Xie, xie. Thank uh -huh. you. Okay. <laughs>